Hey, good morning, Lakeshore. Great to see you guys. So glad that you came out today to worship with us. This is great. Second service, I don't even need to say anything. So if you guys, we're going to put our hands together. We're going to sing these songs unto God. Give him all the glory. Give him all the praise. You ready? Here we go. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of a weight? It was my turn till I met I was free. story church let's sing this out I needed a rescue my sin was heavy but chains break out the weight of your glory I needed shelter I was an orphan now you call me a citizen of heaven when I was broken you were my Yo 
just thankful that we serve a God that is powerful enough to pave the way for us, that no evil can come against us because of him. So thankful for that. I think sometimes we're tempted to doubt that, though, when we go through difficult times. You know, God is good. He is faithful. That's who he is. That's his very nature. But sometimes it's hard to, to believe that he is good when bad things are happening to us. And I just want to speak to that for a moment because I can totally relate to that. It's hard to put your faith and trust in a God that is allowing you to, to walk through uh, something that is a tragic or something regarding your health or whatever it is. There's a lot of things that happen in life, right? But he is always there. He is always walking with us, especially when we claim him as the king of our hearts. He is good. He is faithful. He is just. And it's just our job to trust in him. The Bible says that we trust in the Lord with all our hearts and lean not on our own understanding. In all our ways, acknowledge him and he will make our paths straight. So that is the truth. When we doubt, that's the truth we turn to. And we're going to trust him. And sometimes we sing things and we praise God and we say things because we're, we're in celebration of that and we believe it. And sometimes we have to sing it and say it until we believe. So wherever you are with that, we're going to do it together. Here's our opportunity to speak life and speak truth. He is the king of our hearts and he is good.
You are faithful in everything. You are faithful, God. And you are good. You're good. Oh, we sing. You are good in everything. Amen. Amen. Lord God, we come before you humble people, Lord. We are so appreciative and thankful for this time that we can come to a safe place and worship you. We recognize all of the struggle and the hurt and the pain that you're here to help us through it all and help walk alongside of us, Lord. We are so blessed by that and blessed by you. Lord, I just lift up this entire time to you and everyone in here. Help us, ready us, allow us to receive how you're going to speak to us today. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you. You guys can go ahead and take a seat. Thank you for that, worship team. Oh, my gosh. You know, yes, yeah, yeah. Praise God that he sent us people who can sing because I can't. But, you know, I don't know what you bring with you through these doors. I don't know, like I mentioned, what struggles you have or trials or tribulation or, you know, what, what victory you're bringing with you through these doors. But I want you to know that we're all here seeking a God who will walk alongside of us and will, will give us the strength, will give us the opportunity, will help build into us and want so much for us. And what an amazing blessing that is to be able to come to a place and serve and worship him. You know, we are at Lakeshore, we are all about helping people discover and develop a growing relationship with him. And, and again, I'm not sure where you're at, what you bring with you, you know, but we have this space called Get Connected. It's through those double doors. If you've never stopped by, we stop by after church, uh, after this service. You know, wherever you're at, if you're, whatever season you're in, uh, whether you're a new believer or not believer, uh, or if you've been a believer for 30 years, there is a path for you and there is an opportunity for growth or serve opportunities for you. We encourage you to find out more about that at Get Connected. And, you know, we talk about connections, and that's how we do church here with each other. And we have this Connect card. You'll find it in the seat back pocket in front of you. Pull it out now. We encourage you to fill out some information on there, a way that we can get in contact with you, share some information with you about things that are happening here at Lakeshore. There's always something going on. And if you're watching online, you can fill one of these out as well. We'd love to connect with you too. And, you know, this isn't like a stalker pass, right? Like, I mean, you know, we're not, we're not all about that. We just want to be able to connect with you. You know, so uh, we've been talking a lot about our Making Waves 2020 impact opportunity. This is our annual impact opportunity. And you'll see out in the atrium, we've got that big metal structure. There's a lot happening there, and we want to talk about that. You know, this Making Waves opportunity, this is where we impact both locally and globally. And you'll see out there, we have our impact opportunity locally for our Fall Fest. That is coming up at the end of October. This is where we invite all families, everybody, kids or no kids, come out and have a lot of fun, where we're going to do uh, face painting, we're going to have music, we're going to have crafts. Uh, it's a lot of fun, and we have what's called trunk or treating. And this is where we set up cars out in the park a lot uh, in a safe roped off area. They're not driving around and you, know, you don't have to worry about your own safety and getting run over or anything like that. But the trunks are going to be open. There's going to be candy. They're decorated. They're so cool. And our kids get to trunk or treat there. It's, it's a lot of fun. And uh, for our global serve opportunity through Making Waves, you'll see at the table 
we, uh, we, we have Feed My Starving Children, and we partner with Feed My Starving Children where we, we pack meals for kids who, who desperately need food. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll feed them through, through this opportunity. Our meals go globally around the world to uh, satisfy their physical hunger and also their spiritual hunger as well. So as I said earlier, we are continuing in our So Tell Me About series, and our senior pastor, Pastor Vince DiPaolo, is going to join us today. And I wonder if you struggle like I do uh, to make God a priority in this one-on-one -on -one time, intentionally, daily with him. I wonder if, you can, if that resonates with you. For me, it does. Uh, I pulled a lot out of our first service. And you know, Pastor Vince is going to help us unpack uh, daily time with God. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here this morning. I know that when the sun doesn't come out, of course, we're used to this in Rochester, but when it doesn't come out, it's easy to stay inside and be in bed. So thank you for being committed to uh, show your love for God by being here. And uh, for those of you watching online, thank you to you as well for giving of your time for God. Now, last month, my wife and I celebrated our 33rd wedding anniversary. And, well, thank you. Thank you. And you know, when you're together that long, even people like myself, even men can begin to understand what their woman, their wife needs from them. You know, it takes time. We, we, we admit it. We're not shy about admitting that. And one of the things I've learned is that what my wife wants from me, her love language, if you will, is she wants to spend quality time with me. Quality time with me. Uh, she feels love from me when she gets this quality time where I'm focused on her and, and she's focused on me and... Um, uh, she's so ferocious about this that for our anniversary, we went to a, a nice hotel, our little favorite hotel in the area, for our anniversary, and she act actually asked me to leave my cell phone home. Amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. She thought I would commit cell adultery or something like this with this thing, you know, look at it and... Uh, she was, it was awesome until we got lost for going somewhere. And I said, we could have had the GPS on this thing, but uh, recall, you didn't want this. So. <laughs> so that's how it worked, and it was really important. And um, she loves when I'm focused on her, and um, of course I love focusing on her because she's a fantastic wife. A couple things of observation I want to, first of all, like who could blame her for this, right? Wanting to be with me. I mean, second... <laughs> With me or at me? I, second thing is my wife is someone I love and value. And if I do, I'll make sure that I honor her desires and I'll want to spend quality time with her regularly and faithfully. The same thing is true about us and our fellowship and relationship with God. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning as we continue our series, So Tell Me About. So take out your notes and we're going to answer another So Tell Me About important question. It's a question people ask all the time. Hey, if I go to your church, help me get closer to God. How do I get closer to God? Is there something I can do, must do, should do to get closer to God? Can you help me with that? How would you answer that question? What's the most important, let me put it another way, what's the most important spiritual discipline you can be involved in to get closer to God? What's the most powerful way to grow stronger in your faith in him? What practice will draw you closer to God than any other? The answer to all these questions is identically the same, and it's this. Having a meaningful daily time with God. Having a meaningful daily time with God. Over the years, nothing has helped me get closer to God, know his heart, think like he thinks, and live in ways that please him 
than this practice has. Nothing is even close. It gives me a peace when I'm unsettled, a security when I'm insecure, a freedom when I feel bound by pressures and such, and a closeness with God who, for some reason, for some reason which I will never understand, for some reason the God of the universe, the God who spoke the world into existence, longs for a relationship and dialogue with puny me. That's a staggering thought if you think about it. That God of the universe would want a relationship with any of us is staggering, isn't it? If you think about it. I think it is. And he gives me all of this, and here's the great thing. He can give you all of this, too. Now, recall last week, I did my best to explain to you how to become a Christian. I gave you the three most common plans in the world. The plan of religion and rights, which is a plan that doesn't work. A plan of relative goodness. I'm a good person, I'm a good person, I'm a good person. And we showed you why that plan doesn't work. And then we talked about the only plan that does work, which is credited or imputed righteousness. A righteousness which you can't earn, which God bestows on you when you follow the protocol of accepting Jesus Christ into your life the way he prescribes, not the way you want. But here's the thing. Becoming a Christian, if you accept plan three, by the way, and let me say this, if you want to express your faith with someone, you want to have a point of dialogue, buy that CD and give it to them, get the MP, get the link, whatever it is, and get it in front of people and have them watch it. And then say, which plan are you going to be on? Did you, did you understand the problems with that plan? It's a good conversation tool. Next week, we're going to talk about how to share your faith with somebody else. Uh, this is a tool that will help you. But here's what I want to say. Becoming a Christian is not the end of everything. It's the beginning. So when I graduated from RIT with my electrical engineering degree in 1985, we had a tradition where by departments, we would all go to the president's house. The president was Richard Rose, which I believe he's on the board at uh, Roberts Wesleyan. And so we went to the president's house, and um, the head of the electrical engineering department was Dr. Swaminathan Madhu. I happened to be an employee at RIT. I worked as a lab assistant, got free tuition. It was so helpful when I ran out of money. And so we're there with the president, and Dr. Swaminathan Madhu, a great friend, worked my boss and, and my friend, he said this to me and some others. He goes, Vince, now that you're graduated from RIT, now you're ready to learn. I go, I've done nothing but learn for five years now. And you're telling me now I'm ready to learn. And he basically said, now that you've learned all this, you are now ready to learn what you need for your job. In November of 1999, I earned a black belt in karate, in Ishinru karate. And... Um, my karate instructor said, now that you're a black belt, you're ready to learn. What? I learned how to do weapons. I mean, block and kick and punch. I learned how to beat the <laughs> stuffing out of people. Right? And now you're telling me I'm ready to learn? Yeah, because you don't just block like this. You block like this. You don't just kick like, you know, you, there's little things you do, polish and retraction and other things. And and here's all I want to say. When you become a Christian, now you're ready to grow. See? It's not, it's not, well, I'm a Christian and that's it. So what I want to say is that God actually wants everyone who becomes a Christian to move from relationship to fellowship. Relationship to fellowship. Now, those are two words which get used very interchangeably by Christians, very sloppily by Christians. And even though I know the difference... I use them sloppily too, but I want to get real technical and very specific about what they mean. What's the difference between fellowship and relationship? I want to help you understand the difference. Let's start with relationship because you can't have fellowship if you don't have relationship. So there's an order to this. The first is this. Let me explain relationship. When you become a Christian, you have a permanent relationship with God. It never changes. It can't be broken or changed because... Eternal life, becoming a Christian, is not based on your faithfulness. It's based on God's. I mean, Paul tells Timothy, 
when we are faithless, he is faithful. He can't deny himself. It's not based on your faithfulness. It's based on God's. And Jesus talked about the permanence of a relationship we have with him. Once we start a relationship with Jesus Christ, it's permanent. Jesus said so in a classic passage, John chapter 10, 27 to 28. He says this, my sheep, and that's what Jesus called Christians. By the way, um, in the animal kingdom, if you will, Jesus said there's basically two animals that will describe every human being on earth. You either be a sheep, ding, that's what you want to be, and, or you're a goat. It's not what you want to be. Okay, if I go game show on you a little bit. So he says, my sheep listen to my voice. They listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them, and here it is, I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. You see that? I give them eternal life. What's eternal? It means never-ending. I give them never-ending life. And they shall never perish. In other words, they'll never die in their sin when they stand before God on Judgment Day. They can't lose it. They can't experience death. can't experience hell. When you become a Christian, you are giving, given eternal life. You are not given eternal life when you die. You get the benefits of eternal life when you die. But you're given eternal life when you believe. Now, here's another stag. The first staggering thought is that the God of the universe would care about puny us and want to relate to us. Here's another staggering thought. If you're a Christian, you're already walking around with eternal. You already have eternal in you. You already have eternal life in you. It's a staggering thought if you concentrate on it. And then Jesus says, they'll never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. This is called the belief of eternal security, that you're, once you start a relationship with God, it's all contingent on God, not on you. His grace, not you. Now, I was, the first few years I was in a church, I was taught very poorly in this, and I would say this, no one can snatch them out of my hand. I used to say this, well, I can jump out. It's, it's this, sometimes analogies are silly, aren't they? You just, that's just so silly. Why would I want to jump out of the secure, powerful, loving, caring hands of the living God? No. What's Jesus talking about here? He's talking about this first word, relationship. This is the moment you become a Christian and begin a relationship with God by faith alone and Jesus Christ alone, key word alone, apart from anything you can do to earn it. And notice this is permanent. This is not like like a lot of kids today, they, they kind of they, they go like this. Well, um, um, I was at Tim Hortons, not Tim Hortons, Tim Hortons, and, and I'm, I, I'm not in a relationship with him anymore. Um, I have a relationship with Joe now. Um, so, yeah, um, whatever. So, so that's, that's how people use relationship. Now, I, I, that might have been a 20, year, 20 years ago they talked that way, but... But my point is, that's how people use relate. Like, I'm in a relationship. Um, I'm not in a relationship anymore. LOL. You only live once and all that. <laughs> so, now, that's not how God uses relationship. <laughs> I got to laugh at me sometimes. I think I'm awfully funny. But uh, a true ki- Christian can and will never lose relationship based on eternal life. Can't happen. Thank you. That some people agree with me and think I'm funny. <laughs> Two down, one to go for the trifecta. Now, how does this differ from fellowship with God? Here's the next point. As you develop as a Christian, you have conditional fellowship with God. Conditional. While relationship is permanent the moment you receive Christ, fellowship is conditional and it must be developed to be strong. Paul explained it in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8 to 9. In verse 8, he talks about relationship. Verse 9, he talks about fellowship. Watch this. This is a very important verse. He, God, will also keep you firm to the end. What does that mean? You're not going to lose your salvation. Who keeps you firm to the end? You? No. God starts it. God carries it out. God finishes. God never leaves things unfinished. We do. He doesn't. So that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. Isn't that amazing? Here's a third staggering thought of the morning. Filled with stag- the Bible's filled with staggering thoughts. And here's this. You're going to stand before God blameless. What does that mean? 
so forgiven of sin in the past, present, and future, even though you don't live perfectly, God sees you perfect because of what I talked about last week, imputed, credited righteousness. He swaps your unrighteousness for his righteousness because of Christ and faith in him and receiving him. So there's relationship. Now watch how he now talks about fellowship. He's saying, based on your relationship, now I want to talk about fellowship. And he says this, God is faithful, who has called you into fellowship with the Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. See that? You already have a relationship with him, and now God is calling you. Come on, let's have fellowship. You see the difference? God invites you into fellowship with him once your permanent relationship with him has been established. You can't have fellowship without relationship. But you sadly can have a relationship without fellowship with God. You'd like to think every Christian would accept the invitation to fellowship with God, but many Christians do very little with it in their life. Many Christians, and one is too many, and it's way more than that. Too many Christians settle for, well, I'm a Christian, and I'm going to heaven. You know, I, I accepted Christ, so I'm a Christian. They trivialize fellowship with God. I see it all the time. And while I wish it wasn't true, I see it at Lakeshore all the time. I do. I see a lot of people, just, they don't want fellowship with Christ. By the way, when I look in the mirror, sometimes I see one of those people. And at times, I don't want it. Now, let me illustrate fellowship and relationship in terms I think you'll all understand. So, in September of 1989 and April of 1991, my wife and I were privileged to have two children born into our lives, my son David and my daughter Alicia. They're outstanding, outstanding children. They are my kids forever. Independent of what they do, it's permanent. That's relationship. Now, let's just say that my kids acted badly. Now, this is theoretical, of course. <laughs> but let's just say that my kids acted badly, wouldn't listen, acted in a very unbecoming way, well, what would Sue and I do? we discipline them. We would discipline them. No TV. Turn off the eight-track player. You're not listening to that tonight. <laughs> Go to your room. And we discipline them. Now, when they were disciplined, did they stop being our children? No. I didn't go, go up to your room. If this happens again, you're not a De Paola anymore. <laughs> Didn't say that. No. They have a permanent relationship with us as children, but did it change how close we were to any of the children if they acted unbecomingly at that moment? You betcha. Our conditional fellowship at that time was not very close. Again, this is theoretical, if this were to have happened, of course. Now, here's the point. When we become Christians... God has a permanent relationship with us, permanent. But he comes longing for more from us, deeper fellowship with him as we live out our faith in him. And to my point earlier, becoming a Christian, relationship is just the beginning of what he wants, which is so much more, which is fellowship. So many Christians settle for relationship when they could have fellowship. Now, I want to spend the rest of my time talking about a deepening fellowship with God. I want to get back to my opening, which is this. To get closer to God as a Christian, you must move from relationship to fellowship. How do you do that? I want to give you the number one essential habit, a daily time with God, an intentional daily time with God. Jesus illustrates this idea in Mark chapter 6. It, the Bible says earlier, that in, earlier in Mark chapter 6, it says that Jesus sent the 12 disciples, and he says, I want you to go out, and here's what I want you to do. I want you to talk about the kingdom of God with people. I want you to talk about me with people. I'm going to give you a temporary special power that he gives, by the way, permanently to all of us now who are Christians. He says, I want you to do, you're going to do special signs. You're going to do um, powerful things, and it's going to be awesome. So in Mark chapter 6, they go out and do this, and they come back, and they must have been fired up. Another parallel passage says, man, we saw Satan fall in light lightning. It was incredible. We, you couldn't believe it, God. And of course, Jesus just smiles because he gave him this temporary power. And Jesus picks it up in um, verses 30 and 31. It says, the apostles gathered around Jesus, reported him all they had done and taught. 
then because so many people were coming and going that they did not have a chance to eat along with their general weariness from going on a long run of work. How many of you have ever felt like that? Maybe you just did a long run of work and you're going, man, I just need a break from this. He said to them, come with me by yourself to a quiet place and get some rest. By the way, I'm going to, in the beginning of next year, we're going to do a series called uh, uh, Restart, and I'm, I'm going to unpack this, but, but just for now, I just want to talk about it in general terms. Come with me by yourself to a quiet place and get some rest. In effect, Jesus was saying, you have just finished doing a lot for me. Now I want you to spend some time with me. Because a task person like me tends to go, well, if I do a lot for God, that's what he wants. And sometimes God says, you know what? There's a time to do a lot for me, and sometimes there's a time to be a lot for me. It's not always do, it's also be, right? Would you agree with that? This is the model and the heart that God wants uh, out of an essential habit of an intentional, daily, quiet time with him. And that's what it's all about. Now I want to get real practical and explain this. Before I do, I want to say that in addition to what you're going to learn today, there's two real great ways uh, to go further. Because Sunday messages, I believe in their importance, I believe in their power, but they can only go so far. Next Sunday, we're having our New Horizons seminars, and you, you'll hear all about the penalty of them. But after you take 101, I encourage you to take New Horizons 201, Discovering Spiritual Maturity. I am telling you, if you put into practice what you learn in 201, it will rock your world, and you'll grow spiritually. Uh, there's no reason why anybody can't grow spiritually after hearing this and then jumping into 201. Please, encourage you. If you want to grow spiritually, you're taking this stuff seriously. Take 101 and then 201. And then second, first steps. First steps sounds like 101. They sound so initiatory, but New Horizons 101 and first steps are very different. First steps is a six-week class, and we're going to spend two whole classes on what we're going to talk about here in the remaining 20 minutes or so that I have. Two whole classes. It's powerful. First steps will give you the six keys to helping you start your Christian life right. It's like a foundation. And they're going to be starting next Wednesday. You're only going to meet six times, and you're going to meet right here. It's taught by Dave Fries. It's a great, great class. Man, hundreds of people. It's the most popular class in the history of our church, First Steps. Hundreds of people have taken it, and sign up for it at Get Connected. It starts next Wednesday, October 10th. Okay, so those are some tools. Now, back to the point. Here's the first step. If you want a deepening fellowship with God, here's the first step. The first step involves Bible reading so that God can talk to you. God wants to talk to us, and the main way he does that is through the words and message of the Bible. Whenever we read the Bible, God will use his words to draw us closer to him. You may read encouraging words when you're down in the dumps, and you get the encouragement to draw closer to God. He may provide insightful words when you need help, when you need direction. You'll read the Bible and some insight, some principle grabs you and says, that's it, Lord, thank you. And you deepen your fellowship with him that way. Or he may provide challenging words because you're living a certain way and you read the Bible and God says, that's not the way to do it. That's not the way to live you got to cut that stuff out of your life. you got to stop looking at that. you got to stop taking that. And you got to start doing this. And he'll challenge you. But God always challenges you for your betterment. Not to be mean or don't do that, don't do that, because I'm a killjoy. That's not what God is at all. But when we read the Bible with an open heart, God talks to us. And we deepen our fellowship with him. Peter reminds us of the value of the Bible when he quotes Isaiah chapter 40, and he says this in 1 Peter 1, 24 to 25. He says, the grass withers and the flower falls. We're witnessing that, aren't we, in this fall? But the word of the Lord stands forever. Now, for those of you who are kind of new to this, there's a lot of expressions. The Bible doesn't always say Bible to describe the Bible. Sometimes it uses an expression like the word of the Lord, because the Bible is the word of God, the word of the Lord. It's another term for it. This will stand forever. You know, as a pastor, it's sort of like you go to this conference. Here's how to grow your church. 
You know, here's how you, here's how you do this, here's how you do that. You go, woo, wow, well, we'll do that. And then five years later, it's, it's useless. It's gone. It's not, it's, it didn't work. So you got to go to the next foo-foo conference on how to grow and how to, you know, how to have skinny jeans and whatever and ripped hair and whatever, you know, all the, so that, then, but, but every five years you got to go to the new conference. To, now it's going to be baggy jeans. Then it's going to be pants on the ground and it's going to be tight. It's, 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 you don't know what it's going to be, right? But here's the thing about the Bible. It's always reliable. For 2,000 years, it's been reliable. If the Lord were to wait 500 more years, it'll still be reliable. It's not like you got to go, well, let's get an update. Let's get Bible 1.1. No, there's no point nothing. That's it. It's perfect. It's settled. That's it. Thank you. Praise God for that. Do you believe that? Do you believe that the Bible alone is truth? I believe there's other sources of truth. Well, you drop a ball, it accelerates at 9.81 meters per second squared. I understand that. But I'm saying the only objective truth, because I believe God sometimes puts a thought in my mind and it's true, but that's subjective truth. This is objective truth. There is no objective truth other than the Bible. Don't add to the Bible. Don't have a second book or a second belief system. It's just the Bible. That's it. Now, here's what I want to say. What a mess this past week was in the Senate, wasn't it? With this whole Kavanaugh. I, I'm not trying to get political, except to say I felt bad for everybody except some of those senators, all trying to be all showy and everything. But here's my point regardless of what you think on the political spectrum. Whether it's Brett Kavanaugh or somebody else, you know what's going to happen? Somebody's going to become our next Supreme Court justice, and you know what they're going to do? Somebody's going to hold the Bible, maybe the Supreme Court justice's husband or wife, and the justice is going to put his hand on it and swear. Now, I don't know how long that's going to last, but as wacky and screwed up as our culture is, at least we kind of got that right, don't we? The problem is people putting their hands on the Bible, but they're not putting their hands in the Bible. That's the problem. There's no other accurate source of objective truth but the Bible. So how do we draw closer to God in fellowship that way? Psalm 1 tells us. Look at what it says in the first three verses. Blessed is the one. And look at the three postures that take place here. The psalmist says, blessed is the one who does not walk in, the step, in step with the wicked or stand in the way of the, that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. Walk, stand, or sit. What's he saying? In other words, their whole life is all about doing the wrong thing. But whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on the law, what? Day and night, every single day. Now, if you're new to the Bible, new to Christianity, the law of the Lord is basically another term to describe the Bible. Now, this is the Psalms, it's the Old Testament, so obviously the whole Bible wasn't written, but the law of the Lord is whatever degree the Bible had been written to that time in human history. Now we have the finalized law of God, which is the Bible. And the psalmist says he meditates on the Bible day and night. Now watch this. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Whatever he does prospers. Of course it does. Because they read the Bible, and the Bible is read in an intentional, daily, morning and night way. And it says he meditates on the Bible. By the way, meditate means to roll over, not just, I read it, did it, check. Because here's the, here's, the, here's the fundamental problem. Too many Christians, they ask this question. It's the wrong question. They go, what do I have to do that God won't be upset with me? What do I, what do I have to do for him to be okay? It's a wrong question. The right question is this. The totality of my life belongs to God. Not what do I have to do to get him off my back. Everything I am is his. How do I keep progressing toward that objective? You know, how much money? If I give 10%, will you get off my back? No, because he owns 100%. When you give 100%, I'll get off your back. <laughs> Deal, I promise. 
So if there's any wonder why his life prospers, because he deepens his fellowship with God. Now, how does God talk with us through the Bible? Look at uh, John 16, 13. Jesus said this, but when the spirit of truth comes, let me stop right there. The moment you become a Christian, the third person of the triunity of God, the Holy Spirit, comes into your life. He's equally God. God the Father is God. Jesus the Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. They're persons. They're not, he's not a force field. And he comes into your life, and that's what Jesus is referring to. He says, uh, I'm going to leave, and the Holy Spirit of truth is going to come, and he will guide you into all the truth. Watch this. He will not speak on his own. He will speak what he hears, and he will tell you what's yet to come. He'll give you direction for the future. Now, what does the Holy Spirit hear? He only hears the words of the Father. He only hears what the Bible says. That's all he hears. The Holy Spirit can never, and would he, he it's impossible, but he wouldn't. He, he, he could never speak outside the parameters of the Bible. It, it, it's foreign to him. He couldn't possibly do it. And here's the point. The Holy Spirit will supernaturally take what you read in the Bible and ensure that you get what you need to get from it if you read the Bible with a desire to get closer to God. The Bible is the same truth for everybody. You can't say, well, I believe this passage says that, and I believe this passage says that. No, one of you is right, one of you is wrong, or you're both wrong, but you can't have two opinions. There's only one truth, but there's many ways that one truth can apply to your life, right? I could read a truth, and I could be in a certain place in life, and it does this for me and does that for you and does that for you and it can do a lot of different things but the truth is the truth but here's the point he will give you customized application of how the bible works so what's your first action item have a consistent and customized reading plan consistent every day customized just for where you are spiritually what is the number one key for consistent Bible reading? Do you know what it is? Plan. Got to have a plan. Right? You know the saying, right? If you fail a plan. A solid reading plan. You have to have a plan that fits you, by the way, because the plan for you might not be the plan for you, might not be the plan for you, might not be the plan, right? So here's the thing. We have a Bible reading plan that, no, I don't care if you're like, you know, you just can barely spell the Bible because you know that song, the B-I-B-L-E. And if you've been a Christian for 189 years, we have a plan for you. And you can get it at Get Connected. You can get it at the Welcome Center, Resource Center, anywhere you want. We'll get it to you. And if you need a Bible, we'll give you a study Bible. Let me ask you a couple quick questions. How much time should you spend every day? This is just subjective, but relatively speaking, between 10 and 20 minutes every day. Don't Look, I've made the lie. I've lied to myself. Don't tell me you can't make 10 minutes for the living God. Don't, don't tell me that because that would be dishonest. By the way, better a little bit every day than like not reading for three weeks and then reading for three hours because you don't eat that way. And hopefully you don't shower that way. <laughs> See? So you want to do it every day. So the first part of a quiet time, Bible reading, God talks to you. One last thing I want to say in your program is Common Ground. We are going to continue the most important series we've ever had called Life Foundations. It resumes. Common Ground is our midweek Bible study for those who want to go deeper and grow deeper. That's what we're talking about, fellowship, going deeper. We're continuing the most important series we've ever done in our history, Life Foundations. And look at what we're doing afterward, how to study the Bible. There's all the details, the first and third Thursday of every month from now through May, except December, it's first and second. And this will help you grow. Second. Second part of a quiet time is this. Prayer. You can talk with God. Just as much as God wants to talk with you through Bible reading, he wants you to talk to him through prayer. Because that's all prayer is. Talking with God. You know what's really cool? It's really cool to listen to people who are new Christians and they go, well, like, I, I don't know how to pray. So they pray like this. Um, God's me, Joe. Okay? Uh, I just want to, I want to talk with you. I don't know how to do this. And, and it's, it's just so refreshing, isn't it? And they say they don't know how to pray. And, and, and I listen to the way some Christians pray and I go, please don't learn how to pray. Please just don't. Don't, don't pray. I mean, some Christians are like, God, you know, and it's, just, it's a bragamony. It's a, you know, it's just, it's refreshing because you know what prayer is? Conversation with God. That's it. Not some reading of some religious word. I mean, some of, 
Some of the words people use, it's like, dude, come on. When you pray, you ask God for help and wisdom. You tell him how much you love him. You cast all your worries on his broad, beautiful shoulders, and he takes them. You confess your sins to him, and you always find forgiveness without fail from him. Jesus shows us, shows us that prayer, though there is a corporate place for prayer, I believe it's important to pray corporately and like as a church, the primary purpose of prayer is for you and God one-on-one. -on -one. That's, that's not the only purpose, but it's the primary one. And Jesus says so much in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 6, 6, he says this. When you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray with your Father who's unseen. What's he saying? He's talking about prayer that's one-on-one -on -one here, just you and God. No, no presumption, no show-off stuff. Let me show people how smart I am with my prayer. No, and I'm, I'm teasing. I mean, I've said, I don't think we do that a lot. But. And then he says this. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret. It's a daily quiet time with God. Who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Another translation adds openly. He will reward you. He will answer your prayers with direction that you need, joy that you find missing, peace that you struggle to hang on to, relief and a deeper love for him and his, well, and his will, and that's deeper fellowship. Do you believe that? Do you believe that when you pray, God always hears and God always answers? You know, he doesn't always answer the way you want. But how many of you ever said, man, I wish, I don't know why God didn't answer. I thought it was a very reasonable request. Six months passed and you go, now I get it. Now I understand why. He wants us to want to talk with him. So how does prayer draw us closer to God in fellowship? Look at John 16, 24. We looked at John 16, 13 under the Bible. A few verses later, look at what Jesus said about prayer. He says, until now, you have not asked for anything here's the key in my name ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete ask and you will receive prayer allows us to ask god for whatever it is we need in jesus name by the way jesus name is not like saying okay we'll see you later bye that's how some christians use it like like i have to say it to let god know we're done in jesus name amen no it's not a way to let god know you're done praying because god knows what you were going to pray anyway god knows what you need to pray about anyway and he knows when you're done anyway you say in jesus name because you're saying the only basis i have to communicate to you is because of jesus that's what you say when you say in jesus name you're saying only in, in other words in jesus name could also mean only because of jesus can i pray to you think of it that way And God will answer your prayers and you'll go deeper in fellowship with him. That's called complete joy. That's what happens when you pray. You've talked to him, you got closer to him. That's a deepening fellowship with God. And I find this, that people who pray a lot are some of the happiest people around. And people who don't are the biggest complainers. And I, I got to tell you right now, in my life, when I do less complaining, it's because I've done more praying. And here's my lesson for, for me and for you and for all of us. If we prayed about the stuff we complain about, we'd do an awful lot less complaining, wouldn't we? So, so true. It lifts the burdens of life. That's why I'm telling you, tell you, you know, you know what the most powerful place of our church is? Saturday morning, 9.30 to 10.30 at Synergy Prayer. We have people praying. And you during the week praying, right? Barb's there all the time. And when you're praying... The devil isn't afraid of you until you pray. And he can't stand you. He doesn't want to be around you. He's afraid of you now. Because you've invoked the living God in your situation. And that changes everything. And look at what Israel's great king David said in Psalm 62, 8. He said, trust in him and the Lord at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him. For God is our refuge. He's a help. He's a hope. He's there. He'll take it from you. He's a place to go. That's what a refuge is. A place to turn, a place of help and hope. So that's the key to prayer that leads to deeper fellowship with God. And here's the, the second action item for this part of it. Have a consistent, balanced prayer life. The first part of the fill-in is what? Consistent. Because guess what? Bible reading and prayer have to be consistent every day and balanced. Now, here's what I mean by balanced. 
It's okay to tell God, God, please do this for me. Please, would you please answer this prayer? That's okay. But if that's all your life is like, it's like your kids going, can I have allowance? Can I have allowance? Is that all you want from your kids? Can I have allowance? No. It's okay if they ask for allowance. But you want something else. So can I give you, it's not in your notes, this is for free. Can I give you a balanced way to pray? Write this down. A C T S. Let me give you a balanced way to pray. Here's four things your prayer ought to be about. A, adoration. Tell God how much you love him. C, confession. When you blow it, when you do something wrong, apologize directly to God. T, thanksgiving. God, thank you for my house. Thank you for my spouse. Thank you for my car. Thank you for my kids. Thank you for my lawn. My lawn's better than your lawn. Thank you for everything I have. Everything I have. Count every blessing. Name them one by one. And then S, supplication. That's a fancy word for requests. You go, why don't you just call it request? Because then it'd be actor. <laughs> no, supplication. Just tell God what you want. That's a balanced prayer life. You put it all together as I wrap up. You put it all together and you have a daily quiet time with God. First Bible study, God talks to you. Then prayer and you talk to God. Do that daily and you will move from relationship to fellowship. And that's what will make life most fulfilling. And that's what life's all about. Now, for some of you, this is brand new material. Never heard of it. And that's okay. Um, here's my only ask. Let us help you. We are here to help you if you let us. We are not going to hound you. But we'll encourage you. Please let us help you get this pattern and habit in your life. For others of you, you know this. But here's the real question. You go, I know this. I, I, I knew all that. Cool. Do you do it? One pastor told me one time, he said, uh, today we're going to do a message on tithing. And he said after a church, somebody said, Pastor, when are you going to stop talking about tithing? He goes, when you start doing it. <laughs> How daily is it for you? Are you drifting? God wants to meet with you. Are you doing all you can to meet with him? Just remember this as I wrap up. We're all as close to God as we want to be. If God isn't close, guess who moved? You and I. That's all. Don't get mad at God. And don't get mad at yourself. Just reinvigorate and re-motivate yourself. Don't settle for mediocrity. There's plenty of that out there. We're here. God doesn't want you to live at the level of mediocrity. He wants you to soar above it. Go deeper in fellowship with him. But maybe for some of you, the reason why fellowship isn't working is because you haven't done the first thing, and that's a relationship. So I want us to all just take a moment to bow our heads, and I just want to ask you. So I've challenged you on fellowship, but for some of you, maybe you've never started a relationship with God. And let me explain how it works. Jesus Christ made a way for you to have a relationship with God because Jesus Christ is 100% God and 100% man. He made a way to have a relationship with you that's not based on what you do, but based on what he did. When Jesus Christ bled and died on the cross and rose from the grave, he bridged the gap between God, and he's 100% God, he can do that, and us as human beings because he was 100% man or human. He paid for your sin. He paid for everything you need to have a relationship with him. The question is, will you receive that payment? And here's how you receive it. You say, Jesus, I can't do anything without you. I put my faith exclusively in you, not in religion and rights, not in relative moral goodness, but in a righteousness I could never muster up on my own. And Jesus Christ, who already has been willing to forgive you, accepts that invitation and comes into your life and starts a relationship with you. Say that to him and mean it. Father, help us all have a relationship with you and when we do, help us to deepen it in fellowship with you and when we get in fellowship with you, help us to listen in Jesus Christ's name.
for us to have that relationship, we need to quiet our hearts. We need to listen, open to what he says. When you speak, confusion fades. Just a word. And suddenly I'm not afraid, because you speak. In every single word you say, I don't want to miss one word you speak. Because everything you say is a life to me. I don't want to miss one word you speak. Quiet my That song is such an amazing reminder. You know, I'm, I'm sitting back there listening to the words and, and just soaking in them and reflecting on it and just thinking about all the opportunities that I may have missed for God to speak into my life because I haven't been making him a priority and walking and pressing into him daily. And I wonder if that speaks to you. You know, we, 
We serve a God who loves us and wants a direct relationship, a direct connection with us, not through anyone else, but he wants to speak to us daily, often. And to have a relationship with a father like that, I don't know what your experiences are, but, but it is real, and he wants to press in, us to press into him. And you know, I want to take you back a few moments when Pastor Vince was praying, if you prayed with him, if you made that intentional decision to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we want to celebrate that with you. We want to come alongside you. You know, the Bible says that the angels are rejoicing. There's a party in heaven going on right now in your name, and we want to celebrate that with you. You know, we want to help get some tools and information into your hands and walk alongside you. This is not a journey that you do alone. From now on, you are not alone. And you know, what is your next step? Go right to get connected. Speak with someone. Let them know that you had made that decision so that we can come alongside you and help you in your new walk. And you know, we, we, we get it. We understand. Maybe you've got some more questions. You're not quite sure still, who is this Jesus? What does it mean to be a Christian? You know, if you're open to having some additional conversation, we want to do that with you. There's a checkbox on the back of that Connect card I talked about earlier in the service. It says, I want to know more. You can check that, drop that in the offering bucket as it passes you by. And we'd be happy to follow up. So with that said, I'd like to uh, ask our greeters forward as we receive the offering. And you know, while that's going around, it's just an opportunity. You know, we believe as Christians that God affords us, you know, our, our finances. He provides for us. And, and he wants us to steward that, that financially. To be, to be uh, it's an opportunity that we give back to him, right? And this, this is an opportunity in which, you know, the making waves that you see, it helps fund that. You know, so we, we really appreciate that because it helps us develop and discover relationships for people with Jesus. And you know, we talked about uh, the New Horizons classes. If you haven't taken all those classes, maybe you're someone who's taken one or two or three of them, but not all of them, what's your next step? Your next step right after service is to go through those double doors, get right in to get connected, and sign up. Today is the last day to sign up for New Horizons 301 and 401, so remember, uh, remember that. And also the last day to sign up for uh, childcare if you need that. Well, what if you've taken every class? What if you've got a checkbox on every single one of them? Your next step is to go right out into the atrium to the Making Waves table and sign up to serve on any one of those local or global serve opportunities that we have through our Making Waves, which is Fall Fest and or uh, the Feed My Starving Children. So you guys will just ask you to stand and uh, we'll pray and dismiss. God, we just come before you thankful, thankful for this message that we heard today that you want us to move from relationship to fellowship, Lord. And I pray over everyone here today that, that they would take that to heart this week and, and bring some action into that, Lord, to press into you daily and to seek, seek you. Lord, thank you for this day. I pray blessings over everyone. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everybody. We love you. Have a great week. Thanks for watching Lakeshore Church Online. We really hope that you enjoyed this experience and that you found encouragement from the message. If you want to find out more about Lakeshore and what's going on here, you can log on to lakeshorechurch.org. Again, we have services at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. So if you're local in the Greece area, we encourage you to stop out. We hope you guys have a great week.